Welcome back to VMware View Administration Training. This is the View Local Mode lesson. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what local mode is and in what cases it's useful to us. We'll discuss the transfer server in a little bit more detail than we have up to this point, and then we'll talk about how you can maintain your desktops that are running in local mode and some policies and settings that go along with it. We'll discuss how you can manually download a desktop when a user is trying to check out their desktop across a really slow network connection. We'll go over some of the requirements for local mode, and then I'll list out some best practices for using local mode. Then we'll finish up by doing a few demonstrations. So let's jump right in. So what is local mode? Local mode provides the end user the capability to actually download that virtual desktop that's running on the server and save it to their hard drive on their end user device and execute it using the CPU and memory resources of that device. As an administrator, you have the capability to configure your pool so that the desktops within that pool can be only available in local mode. In other words, they cannot be run remote mode, which is server-based execution. This can be defined through policies, which we'll cover in a little bit. These policies can also be used to define the frequency in which the local desktop needs to talk to the server. If this contact doesn't occur within the defined threshold, then that local desktop will be shut down and will become inaccessible to the end user or anyone else. This is an important policy because as users download their desktop onto a laptop device and take it on the road with them, that device could get stolen, in which case you would want to take that virtual machine and make it completely unusable to anyone else. The administrator also has the capability to forcibly disable that local mode desktop. Now to protect that data that is inside that virtual desktop, the local copy is by default encrypted with AES 128-bit encryption. Administratively, you can up that to 192 or even 256-bit. Finally, one of the configuration settings that we'll talk about later on can allow you to force desktops to only run in local mode. You can do this by disabling the remote mode option on the desktop or individual user. This could be useful if you want users to only run locally and not use server resources, thereby allowing you to shrink the amount of resources required for your centralized view infrastructure. So where are some places we would want to use local mode? First and most important is for users that need to work offline. In our scenario, this would be the purchasers group who oftentimes are out on the road for weeks at a time. This time out of the office may include airline travel, where they wouldn't have network access but may need to work. For users across a WAN connection that has very poor service, a local mode desktop may be a better option. It provides them the ability to have local access to their desktop, but still be controllable through view, including composer operations such as refresh and recompose. When making changes to those desktops, the administrators can forcibly roll back the desktops and then perform the recompose operations to update those desktops. Once the recompose operation is completed, the desktop can be rechecked out in the evening when there's no one else using that network connection. For users that may need regular backups of their desktop and for some reason can't store that data on the network, a local mode desktop that runs on their workstation may be a better solution. This allows the user's virtual desktop to take advantage of any local resources within the workstation, but again be controllable through the view administrator, including regular backups and synchronization with a server-based image. When a contractor comes in to work in your environment, you can provide them a view desktop rather than allowing their device onto your network. If this user needs to work offline, say in the hotel room in the evening, they can then download their desktop onto their laptop and take it with them for the evening, but still providing you the control of that environment that they're going to work within. During the installation, we talked a little bit about the transfer server. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about it. The transfer server acts as a point of transfer for the data between the data center where the virtual machine lives and the local desktop. It manages the check-in and check-out operations of that desktop copying any changes that need to occur between the two, and also any changes that need to occur between the two 
as it syncs up to the desktop that still resides in the data center. The synchronization is what offers the ability to maintain a backup copy of the virtual machine in case the one in the local machine ever gets corrupted or lost. When performing a local mode download, going either to the local desktop or to the data center, if the network gets interrupted, the download process will automatically restart once network connectivity is restored. You do have the concept of being able to put a transfer server in maintenance mode, which will suspend any data transfers to that particular transfer server. As we talked about before, the transfer server is required to be a virtual machine that is managed by the same vCenter that's managing your view environment. During the procedure of adding the transfer server into VMware View Administrator, View will tell the vCenter server to disable DRS functionality for this transfer server VM. Once you've configured transfer servers, you'll need to create a transfer server repository. This repository is just a network location accessed through a UNC path. This repository is used to store the base images for your composer-based desktops so that they can be easily downloaded for use in local mode. But you must make sure to put the repository in maintenance mode while configuring it, otherwise you won't have the ability to make any modifications. This will of course disable any downloads for any composer-based pools. There are two different avenues for adding a composer-based image to this repository. You can do it while focused on the repository settings and add in any base images that are currently in use. Or while creating a linked clone pool, you can tell Vue to automatically add the base image that's being used for the pool into the repository. Vue does several things to maintain the desktop even when it's checked out to an end user device. First of all, when the user checks out that desktop to the local device, View will create a snapshot on that VM that still resides on the server, and then lock that VM so no one can access it. The snapshot is important when we talk replication and backups. Once that local copy is completely downloaded to the end user device, it will try and contact the connection server anytime it has network connectivity. When that local desktop is connected to the View connection server, the administrator, and if you provide the capability, the end user as well, can backup rollback, or check in their desktop. During a backup, the local copy gets a snapshot, and any changes made between the time it was downloaded and the time that the snapshot is taken will be uploaded to the server and merged in with the server's copy of that VM. When performing a rollback, the local copy is completely discarded along with any changes that were made by the end user. The VM that's on the server then becomes unlocked and any connections to their desktop will be made to that central server VM. The check-in process is similar to the backup process, where the changes are replicated over to the server VM. But in the case of a checkout, the lock on that virtual machine is then removed, and the local mode copy becomes inaccessible. So any future connections are made to the server, not to the local copy. The next time the user checks out that desktop, to the same local device, you will not have to download the entire virtual machine, just the changes that they've made since the last time it was checked in. Unless, of course, the desktop has been recomposed and is now using a new base image. View offers us a few different policies which we can use to manage local mode desktops. First of all, we can choose to enable or disable the local mode capability. By default, View has this set to enabled and all pools will inherit this setting unless we explicitly define it on each pool. The user-initiated rollback defines whether or not our end users are allowed to perform a rollback on their own. By default, this value is set to allow. The max time without server contact defines how long the local virtual machine can go without having contact to the server before it becomes inaccessible. The default for this setting is seven days giving the end user an entire week before they have to talk to the network. The target replication frequency defines how often replication should occur for this desktop. This can be set for days, hours, or minutes, and measures the time from the start of one replication to the start of the subsequent one. If a replication is disrupted during this process, it will begin again the next time network access is available, and the subsequent replication processes will queue up 
and occur immediately afterwards. By default, this value is disabled, so no replication will occur unless you explicitly set this setting for your pools. If you do enable replication, the default interval will be 12 hours. User Deferred Replication defines whether or not the user can stop the replication process from occurring. By default, this is set to deny, so users don't have this capability. If you allow the user to defer the replication, the replication will pause for two hours before starting up again. You can also define which disks are replicated. This can be either the OS disk, the persistent disk, or both. In many cases with a composer-based pool, no changes will occur to the OS disk, so you don't care about any changes that need to be replicated from that disk. Your primary concern may be the persistent disk. Therefore, the default setting is to just replicate the persistent disks. You can choose to allow or deny a user-initiated check-in. The default is to allow that. You can also enable or disable user-initiated replication of the virtual machine. This is the synchronization process we talked about earlier. The final policy isn't specifically for local mode, but definitely falls in play with setting up local mode for your pool, which is the remote mode option. By disabling the remote mode option, you effectively force all desktops in that pool to be used only in local mode. There are a few settings on the connection server itself that apply to local mode directly. Enabling the secure tunnel for local mode operations will tell the local mode client to proxy all data transfers through the connection server or security server, depending on whether they're inside or outside the network. Using SSL for local mode operations will encrypt any data transfers between the client and the server. The one operation that use SSL for local mode operations will not encrypt is the transfer of view composer based images from the transfer server repository. That's where the use SSL when provisioning desktops in local mode comes into play. By enabling this setting, transfers of the view composer based images from the transfer server repository will be SSL encrypted. The downside to using these SSL connections is performance. By encrypting this traffic on the client device and decrypting it on the server, you're going to expend extra CPU cycles. The use deduplication for local mode operations tells the view client to deduplicate any data transfers it has between itself and the server. You can also use compression for these local mode operations, where it's going to compress all that traffic before sending it across the wire. These two settings are both very useful for slow connections because they'll result in the use of less bandwidth. The downside to these two settings is that they also will increase CPU and memory activity and potentially disk I.O. as well. Occasionally you'll end up with a user who doesn't have the ability to easily download their desktop across the network. In those cases, you can manually download the desktop for them. This is mostly useful when checking out composer-based desktops across extremely slow bandwidth connections. In that case, you could take the base image out of the repository and copy it to some sort of portable media. This can be a DVD or USB drive. You can find the image's path in the properties of the package in the transfer server repository. You then go out to that UNC path and copy the entire directory down to that portable media device. You can then send that portable media device to the end user or pre-configure it for them and copy the files onto that client device in the local app data directory under VMware, VDM, local desktops, and then a directory with the actual name of the pool. Now the local app data varies between Windows XP and Windows Vista Windows 7. It's the difference between the documents and settings directory and the users directory. The next step is to disable the read-only attribute that will be picked up from the transfer server repository. So this setting must be manually disabled after you've copied the files to the client device. You'll also then need to grant full control permissions to that end user. So oftentimes this is best run as an administrator. And then finally you can tell the user to check out their desktop as they normally would through the view client. The view client will see that that directory already exists and that the base image is already there. 
It then is smart enough to only download the disposable and persistent disks that are necessary for this virtual machine. Since most of the data is in the base image initially, this will drastically reduce the amount of data that needs to be downloaded across that slow link. So a few requirements to keep in mind for local mode. First, in order to do local mode, we have to have a transfer server. And if we want to do composer-based pools as local desktops, you also have to have the transfer server repository configured. Also, your client machine must be Windows XP, Vista, or Windows 7. And it must have the view client with local mode installed. Finally, the pool itself must not be set to refresh on logoff. This clearly won't gain us much advantage when the user has a local desktop, and view isn't available to refresh that desktop when the user logs off. Let's cover a few best practices before we get into our demonstration. First, place the transfer server repository on fast disks. This will improve your data transfers as users are downloading their desktops. Since enabling local mode is a pool-wide setting, you want to make sure that your entire pool will be available for local mode. Since the server version of the virtual machines in this pool may not be used very often, you can easily place these on lower, lower end disks to reduce the cost of the pool itself. This can be one of the big advantages of using local mode, is by saving expensive disks and relying on the end user device. The deduplication and compression features are great at saving bandwidth, but may actually hurt performance when you don't need to save bandwidth. So only enable it when you have problems. If you're going to have a large amount of local mode desktops, they're going to spend most of their time detached from the network, then you need to take that into consideration for sizing your view infrastructure. If 50% of your desktops aren't ever going to run on the server, then you don't need to size the server for those 50%. This could save you a lot of money in creating your view infrastructure. And finally, when you create the desktop sources or parent VM, try to stick to the minimal amount of RAM and CPU that are necessary for that desktop. This is because the view client can increase the resources available based on what's on the client machine. They can't decrease it. So if you create a virtual machine that has 8 gigs of RAM and two CPUs, and the end user tries to download it to a machine that only has 6 gig of RAM and one CPU, they won't have enough resources to actually power on the virtual machine. Finally, use the setting that can determine which disks are replicated back to the data center. When using composer-based images, create a persistent disk so all the changes are written to there. This way you can replicate only that persistent disk and not have to worry about syncing up the delta disk that represents the C drive. That covers the lecture part. Let's jump back into our demo environment and I'll walk you through the configuration of local mode. So we're currently in the server's view of the view configuration within View Administrator. Scrolling down to the bottom, we've already installed our view transfer server and configured it within view administrator. Since we knew we were going to enable local mode for composer based pools, we went ahead and set up the transfer server repository during our install process. Let's review those settings real quick. We set up our transfer server repository to be out on our NAS server in the view transfer repository share using the admin password on the NAS device. The transfer server repository is required if you're going to enable local mode on composer-based pools. What we haven't done yet is to publish our composer base image out to the server repository. So let's do that now. Clicking the publish button gives us the ability to select which image to publish. As you can see, it's automatically showing us all of the images that are being used for composer-based pools currently. We'll select the space install, which is based on our IE8 update. We can also provide a description for this image that we're publishing. By clicking OK, our View Connection server will copy a replica of the space image out to our transfer server repository. 
This is the central copy that will be used when users download their desktop locally. Clicking Refresh will give us an update on the publication status. While that's publishing out, let's go take a look at our pool and enable it for local mode. So the only pool that we want to currently publish our desktop for local mode is the purchasers pool, because they're the users that will oftentimes be disconnected, but will still need to be able to access their desktop. In order to enable local mode for this pool, we need to click on the Policies tab, where we get two sections, our View Policies, which allows to control general features of view for this pool. And we also get a local mode policy section where we can change the policies that manage local mode for this particular pool. Currently you can see the applied policy and that this policy is coming from the inheritance from the global policy. Let's go ahead and click edit. So by default you can see they're all set to inherit. And we have the ability now to override that so we'll go ahead and force it to allow to make sure that that doesn't ever change. Because what we're going to want to do is set the global policy to deny so that only this pool will be available as a local mode desktop. Next is user initiated rollback. Allowing this provides the user the ability to roll back their desktop, which discards the local desktop and any changes that were made on there and revert back to the remote version. The desktop on the server will be unlocked and the local desktop will be completely discarded. The default is to allow this action, which we're okay with. The max time without server contact defines how long the user can use the desktop without it ever actually talking back to our connection server. When this time limit is exceeded, the view client will display a warning message to the user letting them know that they've exceeded the time and it will suspend the desktop. The user must then connect their computer to the network so that it can talk to the View Connection server, which will then unlock the local desktop. The default for this is seven days. In our scenario, we want to be able to give these users the ability to roam for two weeks without having to connect to the network. So we'll manually set this to 14 days. The target replication frequency defines the time between the start of one replication and the start of another replication. This replication is a copy of all the changes that have been made to the local desktop file to the desktop on the server. It will also copy any changes to the persistent disk as well. This default is to not replicate any of that data, which is not what we want to happen, because we want to take advantage of the backup capabilities that this replication provides. So we'll specify an interval of seven days. As you can see here, we get the choice of days, hours, or minutes. If one replication happens to take longer than seven days, the subsequent replication will begin immediately. This could occur if the user connects to the network and the replication begins, but they disconnect before the replication completes. Seven days later, they connect back to the network and that replication continues while the subsequent replication is queued up behind it and will begin immediately after it's completed. The user deferred replication defines whether or not the user can choose not to replicate on the scheduled basis. We'll go ahead and allow this because the users within this pool may be on low speed connections that they don't want to replicate over. By default, if a user chooses to defer the replication, the replication will pause for two hours and then begin again automatically. The disks replicated option allows us to choose which disks will be copied during the replication process. In our case, we don't care about the changes made to the OS disks. We only care about the changes made to the persistent disks. This is the default behavior, so we'll just leave it as inherit. When a user is running in local mode, the user initiated check-in value determines whether or not the user can choose to check in their desktop on their own. The default value here is allow, and we're okay with that setting, so we'll go with inherit. 
The user-initiated replication allows the user to force a replication on their own. An admin also has the ability to force the replication, but we'll go ahead and let the users have that ability as well. And we'll leave this at inherit because allow is the default value. So now we've set all of the policies for our local mode desktops for this particular pool. The other setting that's important to note here is the remote mode policy over here in the view policies. If this were set to deny, the users would not be able to access the virtual machines on the server itself. In other words, they would be forced to use their desktop as a local mode only. We don't want that to be the case for this pool, so we'll go ahead and leave this at its default value and allow remote mode. Finally, let's go change our global policy to deny local mode for the other desktops. These can be found in the Policies section under Global Policies. We'll click Edit Settings just as we did on the pool and choose Deny for Local Mode. Clicking OK will commit that change. And now by default, all pools will not allow local mode. Now let's return to our Transfer Server repository and take a look at the status. You can see the status is now published, meaning that our base image has now been copied out to the NAS server. Let's take a look at that. So we can see there's an image repository folder that was automatically created. And here we have a processing and a published folder. In the published folder, we'll find a GUID. In that folder for the published base image, you can see the VMDK file has been split up into multiple different parts. This is to make the download a little bit easier for the clients. The other files are support files that help to track and maintain the transfer and the status of this package itself. So now that we're done with that, let's take a look at one more set of policies that are important for our local mode desktops. These are set on specific connection servers. Inside the settings for that connection server, there's a tab for local mode, which allows us to enable or disable settings that will manage the transfer of desktops between the transfer server and the connection server. These include the use secure tunnel connection for local mode operations. This will force any data transfers to go through a connection server or the security server. By default, the local mode desktop is going to talk directly to the server desktop to transfer any changes while doing the replication. The use SSL for local mode operations defines whether or not SSL encryption will be used during check-in and check-out operations and replication of data between the local mode virtual machine and the server-based virtual machine. The use SSL when provisioning desktops in local mode defines whether or not SSL will be used when copying the base image to the local machine. The copy of the base image is naturally going to be a large data transfer. So this setting allows us to be able to disable SSL for this particular operation in order to speed it up. Use deduplication for local mode operations tells the client to analyze each block of data in the local desktop and only send unique blocks of data when replicating or checking in a desktop. This can obviously be a huge savings for the bandwidth utilization and speed of these operations but this will impact the CPU workload on the client computer as it checks for identical blocks, and I.O. on the transfer server as it reads the duplicate blocks from the disk. The use compression for local mode operations works similarly by compressing the image as they're being sent across the network. This will also save bandwidth and speed up the transfers over slow networks, but it also comes at the cost of higher CPU utilization as the data is compressed and uncompressed on the client and server. By default, 
All of these options are disabled, which is good for our environment, so we'll leave them as they are. So that will do it for configuring local mode on our pool. Now let's go ahead and move on to showing you what local mode looks like from the client perspective. Now let's switch back to our client machine and show what local mode looks like from an end user perspective. So here on our local machine, we'll go ahead and open up the view client. And like normal, we'll connect to the connection server, log in with our credentials, Now here's where the process changes. Instead of simply clicking connect and connecting to the desktop, we need to actually check out the desktop. So we'll click on this little down arrow here, which gives us the option to check out. The client will now give us a warning saying that this desktop transfer will occur to the local machine. The only option we have is to change the directory that this virtual machine will exist in locally. By default, this is going to be in the app data local directory inside VMware VDM local desktops. We're okay with this directory, so we'll go ahead and cancel out of that and click OK to let View know that we're okay with transferring this locally. What's currently happening now is the View client is talking to the transfer server and pulling down that base image out of the transfer server repository. This is the lengthiest transfer that we'll see. This virtual machine could be staged ahead of time by an IT administrator to make this download a little bit faster. If that base image already exists on the local machine, it will skip transferring the entire base image and just configure the virtual machine for usage. Now that the transfer is complete, you may notice that the icon has changed and that the message says log on to local desktop. Our menu options have changed as well. We can now choose to check in, roll back, or request a backup of the virtual machine. For now, let's just go ahead and connect. Preparing to run desktop locally is another change. We'll actually be able to watch the power on behavior of the virtual machine. Not unlike what you might see with VMware Player or VMware Workstation. As this virtual machine boots up, it's actually executing using local resources on the client device. As it boots up for the first time, you'll see a warning message that lets the user know that it's automatically being logged in and some configuration changes made to it. The primary change that's going to be made is device drivers to help make the virtual machine run better on the local machine. Now that the new devices have been detected and drivers installed, we can restart this virtual machine. Now that the virtual machine has been rebooted, we can log in like normal. And now we've connected to our local desktop. You can see all of Clara's customizations are still in place as we've seen in other lessons, including her documents. From within this desktop, the user has a few new options up here. They can check in their desktop, roll back, and request backup from within here as well. That's all it takes from an end user perspective to download and execute their desktop within local mode. Now let's switch back to the view administrator side of things and take a look at how we can manage these local sessions. Let's go back to the administrator's view and take a look at what a local session looks like to them within the view administrator. 
So switching back to our view administrator, we're looking here at the purchaser's pool, where you can see Clara's desktop it has a status of checked out. Looking in our health status view up in the top corner, you'll see that we have one local session. Clicking on this will take us into the local sessions section of the monitoring area. And here we can see we have a single desktop that is checked out. Out of the purchaser's pool by Clara. It's currently checked out, when it was checked out, how long it's been local, the last time it talked to the server, and the last time it replicated to the server. We can click on the details button to get some information about this desktop, including who has it checked out and what IP address they're at. We can also choose to roll back the desktop, which as we discussed, will delete the local copy and unlock the server copy, throwing away any changes the user has made to the local copy. Finally, we can initiate the replication, forcing a replication to start the next time the desktop connects to the server. Selecting No will actually cancel any previous replication requests that have been sent, but haven't been executed yet. We don't need to force the replication, because clearly replication is occurring. So clearly, once we get local mode configured and set up, there's not much to managing it. Of course, there's a ton more detail than I was able to fit into this lesson, so I encourage you to go check out the View Administration Guide, where it lays out all these steps very well, in a bit more detail than I was able to give you. So let's wrap up this session. First we talked about how local mode provides our end users the ability to download their desktop onto their local machine and take it with them offline and still be able to have access to their desktop. Then we talked about some places where local mode can be useful, primarily when users need to work offline or across a really poor WAN link. Then we talked about how View manages and maintains local desktops and how it can backup, rollback, or check in the desktop. We also covered some of the policies that you can set within View and can be used to manage the environment. I covered a few of the requirements for local mode, including the transfer server, having to have a Windows end user device, having the View client with local mode installed, and making sure that your pool isn't set to refresh on logoff. I covered a few of the best practices for implementing local mode. And as usual, we wrapped up with a local mode demonstration to show you what it actually takes to get it implemented and what it looks like from an end user perspective as well. So that's view local mode. I hope you feel comfortable going out and implementing it on your own now. Take care, and we'll see you in the next lesson.